Okay, <clears throat> it's um, we waited a minute. So good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, my name is Francesco Petruccione. I'm the interim director of NITEX. And again, it's a pleasure to, intro to, to welcome the two speakers of, uh, of this month's uh, mini school, uh, Professor Zurab uh, Janelice and Amartya Goz Gozwami. Thank you very much for, for being with us uh, again today. I don't think I need to introduce you again. You already interacted twice with our uh, participants. So <clears throat> let's not uh, waste further time. And I see you already shared <clears throat> your screen. You're, you're most than welcome to start with uh, your presentation. I, I just want to, uh, last luck <clears throat> in the past, uh, announced that after the talk, both Zurab and Amartya agreed to, 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 to join us in a little social event. So if after the talk, you want to chat with them uh, in a less formal environment, uh, please join us. And I will share again the link uh, in, in, in the chat just now. So Zurab and Amartya, uh, thank you very much. We are really looking forward to part three of your lecture series. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Francesco. Thank you. Uh, yes, this is the continuation of our um, lectures on this elementary category theory. Uh, so Zurab, uh, we talked about uh, what is a category and we talked about products uh, where you give some examples from numbers as well as some graphs. Uh, I was just thinking that a few minutes ago we were talking with uh, Francesco about dynamics. What about we can think about dynamical systems, which is a very general uh, notion uh, when we do the modeling in any areas of applied mathematics and physics, computer science, and other sciences. Uh, maybe it will be good to see whether how dynamical systems can be related or connected with uh, this category theory. What do you think? Uh, that sounds like a very good uh, idea, Morto. I know very little about dynamical systems, so you'll have to tell me what they are. But maybe uh -huh. it would be yeah. possible to find a way of uh, relating it to the theme of, uh, or to the next theme, uh, which we announced initially in the abstract. So uh, we, we explain the concept of a category and the next thing we want to do, we also explain the concept of a product of two objects in a category. So we have some feel of what can be done inside a category. And maybe the next thing we want to do is to explain the concept of a functor. And uh, mm, usually yeah. functors, uh, functors are also about dynamics. So maybe we will be able to relate uh, the notion of a functor with uh, the notion of a dynamical system. But could you please tell me a bit more? So what, what is a dynamical system? But don't tell me too much too much of details because I don't know uh, a lot of things in that area, probably. Very abstractly, what uh -huh. is a dynamical system? OK, yes, as you mentioned, that actual uh, modeling purpose dynamical systems could be quite complicated with respect to structures. But uh, we can actually uh, start with a very simple notion. Uh, let us assume that uh, we have the notion of uh, time. And uh, time, generally, we can take uh, real numbers, positive real numbers, if we just consider uh, from the, so starts from zero, and we just denote these positive real numbers like this. And uh, very intuitively speaking, or in a more general setup, that if we have some time t, then we associate it with, with some st uh, state or space in some, some context. So that we can think in a more abstract way, a set only. But in the real context, this can be uh, more structures like a manifold or a measurable space and with some other structures. So basically what is happening that for each, each time t, sorry, we actually associate a family of functions. And we just actually take the map of these functions at each point. So we will have this ft will be just a functions and we get for each time t, we associate a point here. So let us extend it like here and we group this. And this function just satisfy two properties. One is that if, if at time zero, then 
every point stay same so there is no change in the positions of the points or the particles or the event or the state phase whatever the context we are talking about and so this is one of the conditions need to be satisfied and the other condition is that if we if we move between times so if in time t say t1 if we are in this place and if if we go like this way and another point so x and y and if we move to z then it's the same thing as what we do in say if we do it in time t1 instead of this and if we do it in time t2 then in time t1 plus t2 we actually going from x to z so basically what we are assuming that on the left hand side in this parameters of the time there should be some kind of notion, uh, notion of addition of these uh, positive real numbers and we should need the zero because we are assuming that when time is zero there is no displacement or no movement so the second conditions what we are saying we can actually literally write like this way that if we take these two functions and then their compositions will be same as what we can move uh, in these two times so very roughly speaking zurab this is we can think of a dynamical system where in the left hand side we take positive real numbers and we associate a bunch of functions such that each of these will tell about the displacement of the movements of the particle or phase state on the set so do you think that we can uh, get extract some information from it and leads to some kind of functor uh, well before we do before i give give my uh, attempt on this can i maybe uh, kind of uh, repeat kind of what you said but in my own understanding and you, you should tell me yes, yes. if i understood it correctly um, mm -hmm. so this uh, this set that you're considering the set x mm -hmm. uh, it, it's kind of seen as uh, the set of uh, state states at which something can be right 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 um uh, for example if um uh if i want to understand maybe uh, uh the the effect of uh, earth uh, attracting uh, a ball falling on earth uh, kind of gravity or something like that um uh, the possible states could be the position of the ball in the air and yes, if i know at each exactly, time yeah, and, and it, it, at each time, or the, the, does it is it time? I mean, like if I am at position X, do I have to know exactly what time is it at that point? Or no, 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 yeah. no, no, no. As, as I understood from what you were saying, what matters is is for me to know if if the if the ball is at position X, where is the ball going to be after that, uh, after some time t? Some time t, right? And, and the answer is it's going to be at position Y. Position right, so yes. do, I, do I have the right intuition about this? That that these are these elements of that set are kind of states, and um, the function f um, f t uh, applied to x giving me y. The intuition behind this is that uh, the uh, the system has transitioned from state x to state y after time t. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. So if it was in state x, then after time t, it it will be in state y. In state y, yes. Okay. So your x y can be particles, can be state, can be phase, depending on the context what we wanted to apply these things. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, in that case, I think um, I think there is a very very nice way of uh, of representing this as a functor, um, mm -hmm. and um, uh, what we want to do is first build some categories, but we didn't even say what a functor is. And so basically, let's try to motivate the concept of a functor from this example. Um, yeah. So and uh, Zurab, is this point one and two is clear to you, right? Uh, what what is meaning by these two points? Yeah, I think so because like the, from the intuition that we just described, the first uh, mm. the first uh, axiom tells us that. Uh, if does if if no time elapses, then of course my state will not change. It will stay the yes, same. Yes, that's. And that's the second right. tells me that if uh, after t, after t prime time, um, the state has changed to that, and and then from that state onwards, after t time, it has changed to something else. Then mm -hmm. altogether, starting from the initial stage, from from the initial stages, like in your drawing, uh, if time 
T plus T prime ellapses, then of course we will end up in, in state Z. Yeah, so I think I, I understand the uh, second accent. Uh, so okay. Okay. this reminds me uh, of, of the example of a category we gave. Uh, I mean, the left hand side mm -hmm. part of your information, this, uh, the, the time story here. Uh, mm -hmm. This reminds me of the example we gave of a category in the in the very first lecture, when mm -hmm. we spoke of like in the second lecture we had uh, a category where numbers were um, uh, where numbers were uh, objects, right? Right. Uh, uh, and um, uh, on the second lecture, in, in the first lecture, however, we had a category where numbers were arrows. If if uh, the audience remembers that, so uh, there was this picture we had where. Uh, each number would be in, would be seen as an arrow going from one object to itself. Hmm. And, and so we have as many arrows as we have numbers. So this is a different kind of category than the one uh, where um, the, the objects were numbers. Uh, and um, the arrows were functions. So we also had uh, this category, which, which we studied a lot uh, in the in second lecture, so this is this was mm -hmm. from lecture two, um, where numbers are objects, but this is a, a different category where numbers are arrows. Uh, uh, but then it could also be real numbers. It doesn't only have to be uh, natural numbers. So we yes, could also yes. include uh, uh, one point five, for example. And composition in this category is given by uh, addition of numbers. Um, and uh, it is the usual addition. Uh, I'm answering a question now that Sumaya posted on question and answer uh, um, blog. So it's, it's the usual um, ad addition, which, we, which means that it's commutative and has associative properties. So we do indeed get a category and so on. And of course, the number zero plays the role of the identity arrow in that category. So I want to kind of borrow this category now and, and call this the, the time category. Maybe I'm going to denote it like this, T for time. Yeah. So I'm going to see time as a category where there's only one object and the arrows are um, time, uh, um, um, how to say this? Not instances of time, because we, we really think of this as how much time would have passed, uh, right? So we, we yes. think of one as, let's say, one hour that can pass from any yeah. given point, uh, the time, uh, reference point in time. Yeah, so elapses of time, and each number will denote that elapses of time. Yeah. Now, um, so let's consider that category. And, and on the other side, let's consider a category which is kind of similar to the category uh, we had in lecture two, except that the set might not be finite anymore. So uh, I'm going to call this uh, like this. Uh, uh, it's called the category of sets. Uh, in, in that category, objects are sets and Any arrows, sets. Uh, arbitrary sets. Yeah, they don't have arbitrary to be finite sets, sets necessarily. Finite, yes. Uh, so they could be uh, like like x, the, the set of states that you, you spoke of could be mm. could be an object in that category. Mm. Uh, and arrows are functions between sets. Um, and so that works exactly the same way we had it in the second lecture, except that there we were, we were only looking at finite sets because they were represented by numbers, the, the amount of mm -hmm. objects in that set. And composition is uh, just like we had it uh, in the last lecture. Composition is um, um, uh, the, the categorical composition is composition of functions. Functions in the usual sense of functions. Yes. yes. Um, and now I'm going to describe uh, what is a functor between these two categories. Uh, but we haven't defined a functor yet, so I'm kind of going to give it on an example. And it will turn out, I think, it, it will turn out that uh, a functor between these two categories is, is, is nothing other than a dynamical system the way you described it. 
Mm. So in general, a spanker between two categories is a kind of process that's happening between two categories. Uh, you wanted to say something there? No, no, I just uh, saying that uh, so far we managed to conceptualize this concept of time parameters addition and uh, time zero in terms of a structure or rather a category and on the right hand side what we generally called a phase space or state space that essentially we are taking as this category of sets no uh, the, the phase space is going to be one object in the category of sets yes yeah i mean one or not the, i mean x is one of the object of this category of sets Yes, it's, it, X, X is going to be one of the objects in the category of sets. Category so of this sets, category right. of sets has lots of things in it. it all, all possible sets mm -hmm. are there uh, and all possible functions between sets are there. I mean, in, in a way, the category of sets is uh, kind of can encode all of mathematics because all of mathematics can be based on, on set theory. So mm -hmm. we can think of the of the entire uh, universe um, Kind of living inside the category of sets, um, category at, of sets. As, as far as the universe can be described in mathematical terms. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now we will describe what it means to have a functor uh, between uh, these two categories. And so um, what a functor will do, it will, um, um, so let's, let's, let me draw this uh, kind of a picture type of thing. So if I have two categories like left hand side category and the right hand side category now when we have a category we, we have three kinds of data right we have objects we have these yes. vertices we have arrows uh, we have arrows between them and whenever we have two arrows that that are arranged like that we can compose them yes and we also have identity arrows for every object X, we also object. have identity arrow that, that that's called identity arrow because it satisfies the rule that f anything composed with it gives back that thing also yeah, on the other side right mm -hmm. so just just recalling uh, what it what it means to have a category and now mm -hmm. if i have another category so another category will have its own uh, objects and its own arrows right mm -hmm. um and so one thing I can do, I can consider a mapping of objects from the from the given first category to, to the other one. So I could consider uh, mapping this, for instance, some, somewhere there, and mapping that somewhere here, and then mapping the other object. But I will be mapping all the objects, not just some of them. I mean, on the yeah. picture, I so, only show some, but yeah. So am I, am I correct that this definition of functor should follow the same type of conditions what functions also satisfy with respect to mapping of these objects. Yeah, every object has to be mapped somewhere. And exactly, right. yeah, and the, and, the, and the same object cannot be mapped to two different spots at the same time. Yeah. Right. So, um, and some places may not be also mapped on the right-hand side. I mean, we, yeah, there could be some objects that, that have been never, hmm. never mapped to, yeah. And then, but, yeah. but I want to, want to map not only all the objects, I also want to map the arrows. And so, uh, ah, yes. so if, if, if this functor is called f, then uh, I will have, uh, and, and these objects are called like a, b, c, then I will have uh, f of a, that's where the object a gets mapped to by the functor. I will have f of b, I will have f of c. Right. But then in, in addition to that, I will also have uh, f of the arrow f, and f of the arrow g and it's important that the uh, the source and the target of the mapped arrow match with the source of the, uh, with the source of the target of the ori original okay. arrow after being mapped mm -hmm. by f so if uh, if for example uh, i have an arrow from a to b called f when i map that by the functor it has to be an arrow, not just between any two objects, but it must be an arrow between f of f, um, from f of a to f of b. Right. Then I guess there should be some also good connection between this composite on the left hand side and the composite on the right hand side. Exactly. Yes. So the, the whole idea now is that uh, this functor should kind of 
match nicely with the structure of a category. And, and, and one way of mm -hmm. doing that, ensuring is that it kind of preserves the information about the source of an error and the target mm -hmm. of the error. So that, that, that the information being preserved is what I've, I showed here. But now I also wanted to preserve composition in the sense that if I do end up mapping also, and I, and I have to map everything. So when I map the, the composite as well, right? Now I'm going to have um, uh, the F mapped separately, the G mapped separately, and the composite mapped separately. Uh, I think Zurab right hand side, you don't have anything called F of G compose F. We have F of F and F of G, and then we compose, right. isn't it? Yeah, and we could compose f of f and f of g with each other. We could. Uh -huh. But we could also compose in this left hand side category first, get. And then take the image f. of it. Uh, okay. Yeah, and then apply the functor. And now, if, if we have a functor, then these two things should be the same. same. So, first composing, then applying the functor should be the same as uh, first applying the functor and then composing. And, and the other thing I want also, this needs to preserve the identity error. So taking an identity error of an object and then applying the functor to it, I should get the identity error of that uh, object being mapped by the functor. No. So that's what a category is in general from, from sorry, that's what a functor is in general, functor. from one category to another category. So only these two conditions are sufficient to define a connection between two categories in this sense. Yeah, I mean, together with the together with the fact that the functor should act like a function, it should map all the objects okay. to a unique spot, and maybe two different objects can be mapped to the same one, but as long as hmm. the same object is not mapped to two different ones, and okay. also it should do the same thing with arrows, and it should preserve the source and the target of the arrow, and then hmm. that together with these two equal equalities is what defines the functor. But now coming back to the uh, to the dynamical system, we hmm. could consider on the left hand side. Uh, the time category, where we have uh, one object, uh, because that's how we set up the time category, and all the arrows are just numbers. And so uh, time t could be one of the arrows there. Yeah. And time t prime is another arrow. And we also have this identity arrow, which in this case is time 0. Mm. And then we, we consider the, the, uh, the category of sets. And we consider there one of the objects, which is, uh, so this is the time category. Um, this um, is the category. Maybe we sets. write uh, this identity uh, time as by t0 uh, to have the same uh, parity with the rotation. I don't think we want to do that because uh, you wrote zero before. But my zero was real number. OK, so you yeah, wanted to yeah. keep the point. OK, sure. Uh, okay. Yeah, we, we, we have uh, real numbers as arrows in, in this mm. time category. It is right, yeah. Um, and so on the side of, uh, of the category of sets, we have one object X. That, so that's a set that will be the set of states. And now mm -hmm. we can start uh, establishing a functor uh, from, from the left-hand side category to the right-hand side category. And let's see uh, if I now take this definition of a general functor that I gave on the left side of the screen, and I apply mm -hmm. this definition to, to this concrete situation when these two categories are the specific ones we, we mentioned. Let's see uh, what are we going to get. Um, so um, uh, we, we want to specifically map that unique object that we've got there, the one that we didn't give a name, the, the bullet object, because that's the only object in the time category. We want mm -hmm. to map that to x, so, so that will map to x. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of um, out of all of all possible sets, we're kind of picking one out. The, the one that corresponds to our set of states, the one that, that is the set of states. And uh, then um, we are going to uh, map the arrows as well, right? So yes, now when I map the arrow, times. yeah, I mean, mm. yeah, all arrows are from this bullet to, to the bullet, right? Bullet, yes. And so when I map it, it's going to be a function from where to where. It's going to be a function from x to x to x uh, by this idea of pre preservation of, uh, of source and target, right? Hmm. So because this arrow was a looping arrow, this one, hmm. then f of it also must be a looping arrow since it must yeah. preserve source and target. And so 
uh, so maybe, the maybe we can to, yeah yeah maybe we can actually write it like this way i mean uh, to get a little bit easier idea that we can draw like this way okay thanks yeah that looks good mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so, so now, uh, I mean, th this part of the definition of a functor, the, the one that says that the source and the targets of arrows must be preserved, just uh, tells us that each of the, uh, each of those uh, numbers that represents um, a, a time lapse, each of those numbers will be giving me a function uh, from the set X to the set X, because in, in the category of sets, arrows are functions. Yes. Right? Okay. Um, now let's see what happens to uh, to these two equalities, the one that we wrote here for for this for the thing to be a functor. Functor. Yes. Um, com composition in the category time. Uh, composition takes place by adding time. Um, uh, the, the numbers corresponding to the time lapse, right? So. Yeah. If I have two. Um, Two such things like t and t prime. Uh, composing them means adding them, and I, I want to kind of yes. match with the uh, thing you you wrote there. So let me keep the same order. So this will be t plus t prime. So this f of t plus t prime corresponds to that. I mean, is that function in, in your notation? This is mm. exactly. Um, can you remind me how you denoted this thing uh, with the subscript? We, we do not, yeah, subscript t plus t. Yeah. Now, according to, to this equality, right, uh, that thing yeah. needs to equal to f of t composed Compose with f of t prime. T prime. Right. Uh, which is exactly uh, which is exactly what you had here. Um, that's the yeah, second the condition one. Wrote. That's mm, a condition two. Yes, yes. Yeah. And um, uh, the, uh, my second equality will then correspond to your first equality. So the identity arrow in this t time category is the number mm. zero. Yes. And according to this, this should be the identity arrow of the um, uh, of x because x is uh, f of the bullet, right? Yes. Uh, yes. So th there is a bit of confusion maybe between notation because here we used x. Uh, maybe I should have yes, rather used not x but uh, but a. And in our case, a is that bullet, mm -hmm. and uh, zero is the identity arrow of a. And so on this side now we want identity arrow of f of a, but f of a is x. So it's the identity arrow of f. Yeah. Uh, x so it's the identity yeah. function uh, writing yeah. this uh, these equalities in terms of elements in, in terms of what this function do to elements we mm. will have that um, uh, that um, function evaluated at state x um, must equal to uh, the composite of these two functions right yes evaluated, evaluated at, x. at x and uh, the way comp composition is defined the functions we Evaluate the right hand side function and then the left hand side one, right? right? So this is how it will work. And for the second equality, it tells us that f of zero evaluated at x equals identity of x evaluated at x, which is nothing other than x. Identity, yeah. So maybe notation, have, since we, yeah. yeah in your, uh, uh, since, we, since we, since we moved this uh, dot by a, maybe we should also write uh, a on those places of dots uh, on the right hand uh, block. Uh, yeah, please feel free to do that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm now switching to your notation to, to clarify the link between the two things. And well, this is just x.
So essentially a dynamical system in this sense is a functor between this category of so-called what we said time category and this uh, category of sets. Uh, yes, so it turns out that um, a dynamical system is a functor and I, and I can imagine that, I mean, in, in the beginning you said that this uh, space of states could, could be not just a set but something more complicated mm. like a manifold and so on. And then what mm. we would do, we would then uh, still have a functor, but it will no longer be a functor to the category of sets. It would rather be a functor mm. to the category of those manifolds or whatever yes. kind of ob object that forms. Uh, there yeah. was a question, there is a question on question and answer here. Uh, mm -hmm. The question asks whether f of zero equals, let me actually write this down, whether f of zero equals uh, identity f of a, or whether um, f of zero equals identity of f of bullet. So let's answer yeah, this question. So zero is an arrow. Yeah. Uh, and f of zero must be an arrow. And so um, uh, I, I think, think that confusion came because we first used a dot and then later on we uh, renamed it by a. Yeah, I think this I think this doesn't make sense because identity of um, oh this is supposed to be sorry this is supposed to be identity of f a. Let me um, change that. Um, this was supposed to be like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think both uh, both answers are correct because A and the bullet mm -hmm. are, are the same thing. Yeah, the same thing. yes. Okay, so maybe if, if there are any other questions, it's a good time to, to answer any questions. So the idea is that uh, we, we have this thing called dynamical system. And um, at the intuitive level, a dynamical system was some kind of process that relates time with a set of states, right? And now we were able to describe that process as a process between two categories. Uh, and uh, the axioms of a dynamical system directly translate to the, to the axioms, um, uh, to these two equalities here, uh, these ones which then define um, a functor. So I could uh, have- there is, a, yeah? there is a remark here, which actually helped us, thanks to the Justin, that we have used the addition as a commutative operation, uh, because uh, the question probably is about whether adding the time, it, uh, I mean, with add for t with t plus or t plus, uh, t prime with t, uh, the effect will be different or same, is definitely uh, depending on the addition operation and it will be same if the addition is committed. So thank, thank you, Justin. Yeah. Um, okay, that's, that's a great remark, yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think I kind of answered your original question, right? So uh, the, the, mm, yes. this notion of a functor and, and so, um, we can, we can write down the summary of our result, a dynamical uh, system uh, is a functor from the time category uh, to uh, the category of sets. Right. Okay, so what shall we do next? Uh, okay. Any questions yeah. about this, uh, about the concept of a functor? Yes, uh, maybe, uh, yes, looks like uh, there is a new Q&A. Oh no, it's a thank you, thank you, Sumaya. Uh, any other questions from the audience so far what we uh, discussed about uh, this reformulation of dynamical systems in, uh, as a functor? Maybe we can wait for one minute or something. Yeah, looks like nothing so far, Surab. So maybe. Okay, great. Yeah.
So what should we do next, Amartya? Should we? Uh... Uh... I mean, does this functor uh, preserve something? I mean, what kind of information it gives between the two categories? What do you mean by your question? Like that if I have a product, as we discussed in our second lecture, on the left-hand side of the category of the functor, and uh, if I have a product on the right-hand side of the two objects, uh, Will there be any uh, connection between these two products? Well, uh, that, that, that's uh, an interesting question in general, but in this case, maybe uh, this question is less relevant because in, in our specific scenario, on the right hand mm -hmm. side, in the, in the category of sets, we certainly have products that will be given by usual Cartesian product of two sets. Right. But on the left hand side, uh, this category, the time category, is not going to have a product of objects in the sense that we defined it um, in the second lecture. Mm. Um, so so uh, the question of preservation of products here, unfortunately, cannot be. Will not make sense. That, yeah. Yeah. But then we can give some other examples of functors. Yeah, uh, maybe that's a good idea, actually. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Can so, we come up, think something from what you already did, or we want to think something new? Uh, so maybe one can kind of um, explain kind of the, the point of uh, of functors in general. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, apart from situations like this, where a specific type of mathematical structure, like a dynamical system, uh, can be can be described as a functor. Apart from such situations uh, uh, where we just take one specific thing and we end up uh, understanding what it is mathematically and then it turns out to be something that requires the language of categories to, to formalize. Uh, mm -hmm. Functors also arise um, when we have two different kinds of mathematical objects that form their own categories and we want to somehow link them up. Um, for example, uh, we could um, uh, what, what, maybe we should ask the audience to propose to us uh, 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 some type of mathematical objects that they're familiar with. Uh, and, and we want two different types. And then we will see if we will be able to link them up with, with, with a functor to kind of illustrate the uh, the, the, uh, the essence of a functor as, as a way of linking up different kinds of mathematical structures. Structures. Yeah. Yeah. So, so could someone in the audience maybe write down uh, um, uh, a type of mathematical structure uh, or mathematical object that, that they are familiar with? Uh, okay, I think two, immediately. Could we get two of, of, of these? Uh, Justin has a question that what do you do the category after defining it? Um, we can come back to that question, but 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 let's yeah. first uh, uh, get this uh, examples of, uh, of mathematical objects. Any your favorite mathematical objects or categories of mathematical structure, vector spaces? Okay, we've got one, vector spaces. And now we need another, another different, one. Different one? Another different mathematical structure? Groups. Fantastic. Uh, Francesco said Markov processes. Uh, and now I'm very embarrassed because I don't, not sure I know what a Markov process is. Okay, um, Francesco, I was, maybe... I was, just, I was just pushing my luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Francesco, is it fine that if we, for the time being, work with vector spaces and groups? Yeah, 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 of course, of course. I was just uh, trying to fill the gap while people were coming up with ideas. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I don't uh, know. But Francesco, isn't Markov process in some sense a type, a type of dynamical system or, or am I wrong? Yeah, yeah, in a certain sense. Yes, yes, of course. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. 
but we can discuss it later. Yeah, I will, we yeah. will, okay. uh, sure. I will read up on Markov processes and we can come back to that afterwards. So for now, yeah. I will stick to vector spaces and, and groups. Yes. So both of them uh, form categories. Uh, in the category of vector spaces, which we can denote vec like this. And uh, if we have in mind the specific field over which we are taking vector spaces, let's say field of real numbers, we can then put this uh, name of the field as a subscript. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be real numbers, but uh, for the sake of simplicity, let's work with vector spaces over reals. Um, and then we have another category, which is the category of groups. Now, uh, let's just remind uh, the, the audience what these things are, in, like very, very briefly. So, so in a vector space, we, we are able to add vectors. We're able to, um, uh, well, we have zero vector, right? And yes. we're able to multiply a vector with a scalar. So if I have a real number R, I can multiply it by vector V. So we're able to do that as well, right? And we can also subtract uh, vectors in a vector space, right? Uh, what else can we do in a vector space? We, um, that's pretty much all we can do. And, and we can also combine these operations to, to do more fancy stuff like taking linear combinations. And, but everything yes. we can do kind of builds up out of these basic things we can do, right? Now in a group, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's a it's a coincidence that uh, uh, from the audience we got vector spaces. Uh, this example of the dynamical system, what we were talking about, and those two conditions is already. If somebody is familiar with vector space, that those two conditions are already there. When you talk about the scalar multiplication of the vectors. Okay. Right. Um, you mean in terms of, uh, you mean that we can think of the dynamical uh, vector space itself as a dynamical system? I think that's what yes, you're saying. Yes, because right? yeah. then you yeah. take the real numbers on the left hand side, yeah, V on the right, right hand yeah. side, yeah. and then so, it, it is actually an example of a dynamical system. Yeah, that yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, so, um, in a group, on the other hand, I can um, add uh, two elements of a group. Uh, I can also subtract them, and I also have a, a zero element of the group. But in a general, in, in a general case, in a group, I, I don't necessarily have this commutativity law, so this does not have to equal that. But I do have associativity law in a group, so I, this this thing does have to equal that. In fact, uh, maybe this is something for a separate discussion. But in fact, a group itself can be seen as a as a one object category. Uh, because of this associativity, and, and this will be the identity law, and, and uh, I mean the identity arrow, the zero, and uh, but it doesn't have to be addition of numbers. It could be abstract uh, set with some abstract operation. This could have been multiplication, for example, and zero could have been the the, the identity element for the multiplication. So yeah. we can set up two when categories you, where the objects. When you said this, spaces, yeah. When you said this one object category, you mean something like what we already considered as a time category. That's right, yeah, something example. of that kind, yes. yeah. So we can set up two categories here. One will be the category of vector spaces where mm -hmm. um, the arrows are linear maps between vector spaces, right? And the other would be the category of, um, of groups where arrows are um, group, what, what are called group homomorphisms. So these are functions between groups which preserve all, all of these uh, operations, the, the addition, they preserve the addition, they preserve zero, they preserve subtraction. So they preserve the entire structure. Also on the other side, everything is preserved. Now, one thing we notice about these two different structures, um, if, if I like compare them and, and put them next to each other and compare them, uh, is there something you notice, Amorco? It looks like uh, there is some kind of group type of structure is there already in vector space. That's right, yeah. So every vector space inside it kind of has a group ingredient, right? So mm -hmm. the vectors in, in a vector space do form a group under addition of vectors. Right. Uh, I mean, I said here that the addition doesn't have to be commutative, but it's not that it's not allowed to be. It could be commutative as well. And in fact, of course, addition of vectors is commutative. Uh, so uh, we could take a vector space, and then to a given vector space, we could assign the same space, but now seen only as a group. We've forgotten about the scalar multiplication. 
Ah, so basically what you are saying that vector space has two structure. One is this group structure of vectors. Another is these scalars, which we denoted by this set of real numbers. Yes. And then you, in some sense, you are telling me that we should completely forget about the scalar part and only think about the group, uh, group part, which is these vectors. And then we landed up with this category of groups on the right hand side. That's right. So if I very briefly denote a vector space as a, as a triple consisting of a of the set of vectors together with the operation of addition and the scalar multiplication operation, then I could, uh, uh, in that data of three things, I can remove one of the ingredients and I will just get data of two things, the set mm -hmm. uh, of vectors and, and the way of adding things there. Um, uh, I mean, theoretically one could have uh, different multiplications on, on the same vector space, right? I mean, it depends on what kind of field you're working with maybe and, and so on. But so what I'm trying to say is that uh, addition does not uniquely determine necessarily multiplication. So adding this multiplication into, into our uh, information uh, uh, makes the vector, uh, make this set V together with plus to be something more than just set V with plus. Now it's set V with plus and multiplication. But on this other side, on the side of group, we forgot about multiplication. We just keep the set B only uh, coupled with the, with the plus there. But and one thing, Zura, which, which probably we need to be careful because uh, in the definition of vector space, we said our addition is uh, commutative in the sense that x plus y is y plus x on the left hand side. So are you also forgetting that it's it forget to be commutative on the right hand side? Yes. So uh, when I see a vector space, as an, um, when I map a vector space to the corresponding group, the operation is still commutative in that object, but, but there might be other objects in the category of groups where uh, the commutativity fails. Commutative, okay, right. And now if I have a linear map uh, between vector spaces, um, then it gives rise to linear maps. In fact, it will be the same function because a linear map is supposed to preserve all of these ingredients, it's supposed to preserve plus, it's supposed to preserve zero, it's supposed zero, to preserve so. minus, it's supposed to preserve scalar multiplication, right? Um, and, and so this linear map what, is also this linear map is also sometimes we write in as a linear transformation, uh, which may be more familiar uh, terminology. Okay. So if it preserves all of these things, then it will, in particular, preserve just this part of the structure, right? So if I have right. F is a linear map from a vector space um, uh, V plus dot to a vector space W plus dot, where this plus and dot might be different operations, different from the original one in, in B, then uh, the same function that preserves both plus and dot will also be a function that preserves um, just plus in particular. Yeah. And so that's uh, how in the meantime, we have a question from Sumaya that can V plus dot map to V dot. Uh, Sumaya, this uh, will not make sense because V dot is not a group structure. That dot but is coming the, as a scalar thing, multiplication. Yeah, the dot thing doesn't have kind of equal rights to the plus because the plus adds yeah. ve vectors, uh, and, but the dot multiplies a vector with a number. It doesn't with the multiply two vectors with each other. It only multiplies a vector with a number. Um, uh, and okay, so what we're getting so here is, is, a, is a way of kind of forgetting the structure, we are getting basically a functor because since composition in both cases is just defined as usual composition of functions, hmm. we will automatically have uh, this preservation of composition and, and also preservation of identity errors. So can we call this forgetful functor? <laughs> Yes, in fact, that's how it's called. Uh, uh -huh. It's called a forgetful functor because it for, forgot uh, some part of the structure. Um, just to give maybe another example of a functor coming out of, let's say, vector spaces, we could have forgotten not just the fact that it had multiplication, we could have forgotten everything. So yeah. we would get a functor uh, from vector spaces to sets. So another forgetful functor uh, where we take a vector space, which, which is a, a set together with plus and dot, and we just um, 
forget the, the existence of the plus and the dot, and we just view a vector space as just a raw set. Of course, yeah. it might be difficult to recover what the vector space is from the set because um, uh, if I have a set, right, there might be many ways of defining vector addition and, and mm. scalar multiplication. I mean, even on the Cartesian plane, even on the, on, on the, on the plane, when I define vectors, addition of vectors on a plane, I first need to fix what is my origin of the coordinate axis, right? right, and, then, right. and then I can define, and then vectors become arrows going out of that, and, and then I can define addition like this. So if I don't fix the origin uh, of the coordinate uh, of, of the plane, then I don't know how to add things in there, right? So a set yeah. does not remember, um, the set does not remember what the, um, uh, what the multiplication and addition were. So we have really forgotten some information. Yeah. Now, uh, but, of uh, course, yeah. yeah. We can also, doing this, forgetting things in two steps, right? We forget for scalar structure, but then we, from vector, we go to group, and then we forget the, also the addition structure of the vectors, and then we landed up to set. That's right. We could, we could forget it step by step, and, and then we, we would get a, a, an interesting uh, uh, idea of composing uh, functors, uh, just like functors uh -huh. can be composed, functors can also be composed. So these, these two forgetful functors will, will then create the, the third one. But maybe these examples kind of feel a bit too, too easy examples. So let, let's do something a bit more interesting. Let's try mm -hmm. to go back from sets to vector spaces. And I would like yeah. to ask the audience if they could think of a way of starting with a set, arbitrary set, uh, right? Let's say set uh, B, okay? Uh, how would you create a vector space out of a set? Is there a way, is there a natural way of creating a vector space out of a set? So we are reversing the process now. Uh, yeah, we now want to create a vector space out of, out of a, an arbitrary set. And we would want to do it in such a way that we have a functor. In other words, if we create some vector space out of B and we have this situation where we created a whole bunch of vector spaces, we would even want to be able to create, um, um, so, so from, from starting from functions like F and G between those sets, we would want to create uh, linear maps between those vector spaces, right? Mm -hmm. And we would want to do this in such a way that we will get a functor so that when I um, create a linear map out of the composite, um, that will end up being, um, I think, yeah. F of G, V of G, decompose. Yeah. So, so, so that, that, that V of G composed with F end up being V of F and then composed with V of G. And also I would want identity uh, arrow of B to map to uh, V of that, which I want to be the same as identity of V of B. I also want um, the equality of, um, of this thing with V of G. So I've kind of displayed one more time the whole information of what a functor should do. So is there any suggestion about how we could start with a set and create a vector space out of it? So Maya is saying, form a, form a group with the set, then add a field to that group. Well, easier said than done. The whole question is how to do that. If I just have a random set, uh, I might have so many different choices of what group structure to consider on it. I wouldn't know uh, which one to pick. Or maybe if I have like, let's say the empty set where there is no elements at all, then I won't right. even be able to, to necessarily turn it into a group because the group needs to have identity elements. So we are starting with an arbitrary set. How can we get a vector space from it? Any uh, we, idea, suggestion? We could maybe simplify this situation a little bit. Instead of taking the category of sets, let's take the category of natural numbers, the one we, we looked in detail in, um, hmm. in the second lecture. So the category, right. so th this corresponds to just working with finite sets, right? right. The category of natural numbers from, from uh, not yesterday, but lecture two. Um, did I say yesterday? Then the question will be not turning a set into a vector space, but turning a number into a vector space. So is there a way to turn a number into a vector space? 
I think somebody had a raised hand and then the hand was lowered. So maybe somebody wanted to say something. Uh, yes, I think. Uh, uh, ah, yes, yes, I can, I can. Uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, talk. Um, I, I gave you the permission to speak, Joseph. Please. Uh, yes. What about if the um, in um, objects in the yeah the objects are um, positions in space, and if you yes, and then you can. Uh, it's a typical way to construct a vector space in physics by beginning with the with the points in the position space, and then you find uh, also um, additionally an origin where you introduce first the so-called position vectors, and then you get I think also another type of vectors which. Uh, uh, can be described with another category, and you have then a functor also between uh, position vectors and free vectors. Yes. Uh, but first that, of all, that, yeah. what about what about if the bees? What first of all, these are two what have been two uh, thoughts. Um, uh, what about if we uh, regard the bees, the bees as uh, uh, positions uh, in space? These are a the lot of, uh, this is a set, a set of positions in space. But uh, what are the arrows in the category? The arrows are the vectors then, from one point to the other one. Uh -huh. um... These are the vectors, as you have written it uh, just before. So between any two any two points, there is exactly one vector. Yes. There's exactly one arrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, perhaps your arrow here in your picture could be uh, one. Yes. OK. Also, uh, yes. Uh, also, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have your vectors. And uh, um, but normally we introduce also an origin from which um, uh, every vector starts. And then we call this um, the position vectors, mm -hmm. odds vector, yes. Mm -hmm. so and, if if and, the category here consists of objects as, as, as positions in space and, and arrows as vectors, yeah then basically in this category, uh, we will always have exactly one arrow between e every two objects, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. That will be that corresponding yes, vector. Yes. yes. And, uh, yeah. And yes, yeah, yeah. and you introduce a special point in space, which could be the origin. Yeah. And um, then you have all, you, you regard all these vectors starting from this origin. So this is a home set somehow. Yes, from this. Uh, and then, uh -huh. yes, and then you look at the other, in another category where all, where, um, um, yes, where all these are uh, mapped in, into it, in which it, uh, the, these, this home set is, uh, is uh, um, mapped, and then you change your origin, and then you have in this, uh, other category, also a transformation. And I think this is something like a transformation in a, in a mapped category. And this is, I think, such, such something like natural transformations also. Could it be? So, uh, well, what I, what I see from what you're saying is the following, and tell me if, if that's what you wanted to say or not. Uh, so uh, I could take uh, each object now, and I could map it to the vector space, which, which turns my, let's say I'm working in a, in, inside a plane, right? Mm -hmm. one, one side, one, once I choose this to be my, my zero vector, yeah. my, my origin, uh, yeah? Mm -hmm. Then the entire plane becomes, becomes a vector space. Yeah, first of all, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that's where I could map the, uh, uh, the point V. And if I have point W, I could map that to uh, the same plane, but now seen uh, as a vector space where W is the zero vector. Yeah. But then you can change the origin and we look to another home set and say transform all these things into the, to the, uh, yeah, to the um, other category. 
And in these other categories, where the, in the map of the ground category, uh, you can study the relation between these vectors and the transformation between these vectors. There's nothing else as coordinate, coordinate transformation. Coordinate transformation in your basics, in your basics uh, space. Uh, to finish setting up a functor, we need to say what, what's going to happen to arrows. So uh, if I have an, uh, a specific vector here, the vector that joins B and W, let's call mm -hmm. this uh, vector uh, X, let's say, um, mm -hmm. uh, this should give me a linear map uh, from, uh, and, and would that linear map be uh, um, maybe um, um, translation by the X vector? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then that seems to work out. To, to yeah. Yeah. So we will be mapped to W. Mm, yeah, I think. Um, um, uh, uh, of course, uh, now let us um, uh, stick to the main problem now here. How could I introduce, or what is, uh, what about the introduction of um, origin in, in this space where you have some vectors? That's the first problem I would, would like to resolve. In your first, in your um, picture, a little yeah. bit, go back to the first picture about vector space. Now, once more. Yes, here. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, in this one, where the f and the g of f and the g is, is there, and where you um, uh, have this uh, vector space here, forget now the group um, at the right position. Um, then, um, where, how, what about an origin? If you introduce an origin, what does it matter now? Does it change the whole picture? So w w when I was talking about the vector space, I, I, I had in mind something that already has an origin. Uh -huh. That's, that's uh -huh. given by the zero vector. That, that was the, the origin was the zero here. That, that was uh -huh. the origin. Uh -huh. uh, that's your origin already, yes. Yes, I, I, yes, I understand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, this sounds very interesting discussion, but uh, probably we are running a little bit out of time. So maybe yeah, no, okay. we can no, no, continue no in the Kumo space. Uh, or? Oh, no problem. Our Zoom license is paid by the university, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Francesca. Um, so uh, just to finish this um, this example, um, uh, Josef. So. Uh, uh, if I if I declare V as, as my origin, right? Yeah. Um, and then I declare W as my origin. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. The, the transformation uh, I think that we will have here. Yes. Translation will um, will basically be. Uh, uh, let's be a bit more concrete here. So let's 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 say P is equal to R squared. Hmm? To uh, us. To ask where? Uh, I mean the place. Yes. And and we probably want to map this to R square as well, and and this to R square as well. Yes, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I would imagine then then the uh, the linear map here is translation by the x vector. Yes, and it is a coordinate transformation. Yeah. Yes. And what is the relation? Uh, what is um, then the Consequence for all the other vectors which are mapped also. Yes, that's a good that's a good, good situation now. Mm -hmm. A good last question. Yeah. And this is a coordinate transformation, and this is a, is a mapping in the mapped category. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. It's a linear yeah. map. It's certainly. Uh... Yeah. 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 No, wait a second. Sorry. It's it's. Uh... It's not a linear map because it's not going to preserve the zero vector. So that's why one has to uh, uh -huh. fix the zero vector. I, I think we are, we are a bit lost in the representation of things. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
what I, I, I should say, um, the coordinate transformation is uh, in physics a very, very um, prominent, prominent um, 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 point, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would be very interesting to translate this into the language of um, categories. Yes, and I think that the factor is there uh, very crucial, very important for that. Mm -hmm. But we can discuss it ne next time, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think there also another raised hand. Let me allow, um, uh, Eli, I've already done this, <laughs> sorry, pa Parta yeah. to, to ask the question, yeah? Yes, Parta? is very nice you just instead of taking p to be r2 you take uh, well this will happen for finite dimensional ones you take uh, those points to be in to be natural numbers and from m to n you are matrix your uh, morphisms are just uh, m cross n matrices of reals and then you see this, uh, it fits in with what he's saying as canonical coordinate transformations because they are just matrices of reals. And then when you have a functor from that category, yeah, into uh, that, same, that, yeah, that's that, third, so, uh, I think the problem with our discussion was that uh, we, 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 we constantly change the categories. So before one describes a functor, one should first stick to, to, to a specific categories. And so the original question uh, had here uh, the category of natural numbers. Uh, we wanted to function from that to vector spaces. Then in, in Yosef's suggestion, uh, the category was a category created out of a single vector space. Uh, that's this category. And, and in part the suggestion, it's a third category, uh, uh, which is uh, a category where objects are still natural numbers like uh, uh, like before, but arrows are no longer functions between corresponding sets, but arrows are m by n matrices. And these, these, these are the representations of canonical coordinate transformations, what That's Joseph right. is yeah. speaking yeah. about. Yeah. And the functors from here are exactly our vector spaces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then the linear map will be uh, the one corresponding to the matrix. Yeah. The one that is described by the matrix. Right. And that's how what Joseph said, the free vectors and position vectors are explained. The, uh, posi the position vectors, you need to select that identity, that origin. Yeah. Yeah. And the moment you do so, your your RN, so you can have obviously have RNs, uh, isomorphic copies of RNs with different origins. One translates of the other, or rotates of the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, are you suggesting, part of that this uh, th this is the correct way of uh, uh, thinking about Joseph's question? I thought so because uh, that's how, because you are saying PV, that means you're choosing your origin. So that means when you are coordinatizing, you're choosing your origin and your uh, initial uh, coordinate system. Mm -hmm. So that's what Joseph is saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, now, if, if we want this top category here to be, um, uh, uh, arbitrary vector spaces, which will of course include r to the power n and r to the power m. Um, uh, but if we want also to go be, be able to go backwards, so we will now have a functor this way, but if we want to go backwards, which will be the dimension functor, uh, yeah. assigning to every vector space's dimension, then we will indeed have to choose basis of the of basic mm -hmm. coordinates of the vector mm -hmm. space before we can um, know how to how to interpret a linear map uh, uh, as a matrix right mm -hmm. so then if, if we want to go backwards also if we want this process to be reversible then we actually need to be working with with a category where 
a vector space is given together with coordinate system. Mm. And mm. so, but in, in this case, of course, the coordinate, the coordinate system is the standard one. Yeah, yeah, correct. And then we can also reverse the process and we'll have a functor going backwards as well, which assigns to each vector space its dimension and uh, to a linear map between uh, two, two vector spaces with chosen, chosen coordinate systems. It will assign, um, so this goes to dimension of three prime. And so it will assign to that uh, a, a, a matrix, um, uh, which is the matrix representation of the linear map with that chosen coordinates. Yeah. yeah, that's what we generally call the change of basis matrix. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm, uh, well, no, the, the change of basis. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if the linear map is the, describing the change of yeah. basis, yeah. The corresponding to, to the, uh, yeah. But we can have arbitrary linear map that, that in vector spaces with chosen basis and then it should be. Yes, yeah, of course, yes. Right. Mm. But there are quite a lot of functors in the world and it's easy to um, to get lost with them. Um, uh, but Yosef, do, do, do you think we, we more or less kind of addressed your, your point of interest? Yes, yes, yes. Um, thank you. Yes, uh, I will think about it <laughs> once more. <laughs> but I will read carefully your script. <laughs> and, and I will also come back to you about uh, the thing we were trying to do here. I think we can still do something meaningful here. I just blanked out and I wasn't able to make further progress. So thank you also for Partha, Partha for, for his help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So, so Zura, maybe we stop here today and... Uh... Well, uh, before we stop, I think there was a question from Justin, which we didn't answer, uh, Justin Mungana. Where? He asked, what do you do with the category after defining it? Ah, yes, 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 sorry, yes. Um, I think that's a, a very general type of question. I mean, once you define or describe a certain mathematical structure, what do you do, you do with it, right? And there are two things you can do. In, in general, one is to try to uh, model or formalize whatever you are interested in real life in the language of that mathematical structure, so that that language then provides you with either a computational tool or conceptual tool for understanding your real life phenomenon better. So that's one thing you can do uh, that, that leads to applications. Uh, and also with a category, you could do that. For example, you could take uh, uh, some portion of physics where vector spaces are important and you uh, try to translate that portion in the language of, of a category which hopefully could give some kind of information about the, the original physical uh, situation. And another thing you can do is you can try to relate your mathematical structure, in this case a category, with other things you know in mathematics and ask purely mathematical questions that might not necessarily be relevant to um, to the, uh, the application from which the category was defined. Or maybe it is relevant, but the relevance only comes up after, after many, many years. Um, now, specifically with categories, uh, uh, the answering this question is basically describing uh, the entire research area of category theory. So I don't think this question is the kind that I can answer, that we can answer about doing. Uh, <laughs> last but yeah, but it's yeah. an important question, of course. Definitely. So only two aspects broadly we can say. Once we know a category, we can study mathematical structures, understand mathematical structures, unifying mathematical structures, or we can use that category to answer some real phenomena, events, and try to understand that real problem, depending on the context. Yeah. And of course, the, the, the goal of our lectures is to really kind of introduce the, the, the listener to the most basic and fundamental concepts and, and to develop some intuition around it. So hopefully today's lecture uh, allowed one to have some intuition for what a functor is, at least for someone who was familiar previously with dynamical systems. Um, and that also uh, functors that have nothing to do with dynamical systems per se, 
uh, also are, are, are quite uh, a lot. And, and so this gives a good uh, illustration of how you can take one type of phenomenon and express it in the language of categories and then get a concept with just minor generalization, um, which is also then applicable and relevant to all sorts of other different situations as well in a completely different way, which previously would have been unrelated to the original. Uh, uh, <laughs> Yes, so then let's end here then, if there are no other questions. Yeah, yes. Yeah, then Subat, Surab and Amartya, thank you so much for another very exciting <clears throat> lecture. And you uh, heard from the many questions, many comments that um, there's really, people are really keen to learn. <laughs> so thank you very much uh, again. Um, we will continue next Tuesday. But uh, maybe some of the participants would like to briefly interact uh, socially in a virtual environment with Amartya and Zurab. And um, I've posted the link in the, at the beginning of the chat, so you will find it there. Just click there, and uh, we might uh, meet in, in um, sorry, what is it called? In Kumo space uh, in, in a minute or two. Yeah, so no, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank you very much Francesco. Thank you. Thank you. And also thank, thank you everybody Joseph and Parta for the very interesting comment that helped probably many people understand better what we are doing yeah thank you thank you thank you bye bye